Hello, fabulous friends and fans. Welcome to this latest installment of a special series of videos that I'm doing, really answering some of the questions that I get from you guys out there through Facebook, Twitter, Google+, and of course, through my website, NadiaShaw.com. Thank you so much for your interactions. So one of the questions that I'm asked a lot, actually, perhaps one of the top five questions I'm asked a lot other than, you know, what's happening with me is why do I practice Western astrology and not Vedic astrology, especially in light of the fact that I am very clearly of South or, or South Asian origin. Um, and uh, I actually have to take you a little bit back into the history and the development of astrology. And really, astrology is a living practice, and it responds to the needs of the culture it finds itself in. Astrology, I don't think, is something that you believe in or you don't believe in. It's something you practice or you don't practice. You connect with it or you don't connect with it. It's not something to believe in, like you wouldn't believe in yoga, you wouldn't believe in meditation, or you wouldn't believe in prayer. You believe in a other energy, and as a result, your yoga, your meditation, your prayer is a reflection of what you believe is true in the world, what you believe is spiritual in the world. And the same is true for astrology. So if we look at the development of astrology in these two different parts of the world, so Western astrology originally arose from, or what we now call Western astrology, really the foundation of which is a text called Tetrabiblos by Ptolemy. And in this book, Ptolemy has some very specific recipes uh, when looking at the sky. So for example, he has uh, some really interesting sort of formulas where he says, if the sun is in this part of the chart and it is making this type of conversation with or aspect with Mars in this other part of the chart, the person will suffer a burn to the hands at the age of seven. Like literally he's got really specific formulas like that. And it arises from a worldview that is polytheistic, right? That is based on lots of different gods, lots of different energies. But of course the world changed, the world evolved. And Europe eventually entered the Dark Ages, and um, basically all these Greek texts were sort of lost, and they were picked up by the Arabs, the early Muslims in the Golden Age of Islam, the very beginning, so around 700 to 1400 um, AD is when these texts were uh, begun to be translated from their original languages, largely Greek, into Arabic. And you have to think about the time of the culture that this was. This was a time of a new religion, a new monotheistic religion. So the culture was transitioning from a polytheistic worldview to a monotheistic worldview. And in monotheism, one of the highest understandings of of life and of what it means to be human is that we have free will. Well, it's one really high orientation, one understanding of monotheism is that we have free will. It's one of the highest assertions that monotheism makes. And so what you find in the writings at that time of the astrologers at that time is they're translating these texts and they understand these are polytheistic texts and they understand they arise from a world view in which people didn't have a lot of free will. They didn't really have a lot of time unless they were, you know, very limited segment of the population. They didn't really have the time to consider things that today, um, even today, are a luxury in a large part of the world. Um, things like self-actualization, things like the meaning of life, um, things like directing your will and, and how to best navigate um, the course of actions to your advantage. These weren't things that a lot of people could think about because a lot of people sort of had their life written for them, in some cases before they were even born. Your life was really dependent on the family that you were born into, what the family did for a living, and your family decided who you would marry and your family had property. If they had property, you had it. When they, when they died, it was passed on to you. If they didn't, you didn't have it. So a lot of things were already written for you. And once we get to the monotheistic religions, it becomes much more about what can you do for yourself? How can you improve your life? How can you move your life forward? And so we start seeing the astrologers first putting um, the astrology into a monotheistic context. So understanding the sky, not as these different gods, but as an expression of a singular god. And what you also see at this time is that the um, interpretations start to evolve because astrology is a living practice. It responds to the needs of a culture. 
And what happens at this time is, you know, in particular, I'm thinking of the writings of Abu Mashar, in which um, you start seeing him say things like, okay, if the sun is here and Mars is here, this person might have a problem with temper at different times in life. Um, this person would be advised to use that energy towards athletic pursuits, for example, right? And so this is where you start seeing astrology being used as a tool of self-awareness and as a guide to direct your energy as well. I'm also reminded of, you know, I'm, I'm very big on um, Ibn Arabi because I wrote my MA dissertation on him. So whenever I can, I give him a, a shout out to thank him. And um, he lived about a thousand years ago or so. And um, he was a Sufi mystic, a philosopher and an astrologer. And he believed that everything in the chart was perfect. Everything in the chart was exactly what it needed to be so that you could fulfill your highest potential in this life. And what that highest potential was would be determined by you and your choices and the direction of your will. And so that was hugely influential and his writings were hugely influential in the way that I understand the sky and the way that I understand the chart. Now, what happens after the Arabs is um, during the Renaissance, it is their translations that are then translated by Renaissance astrologers, primarily priests, um, who translate the Arabic into Latin and start fitting astrology into a Christian concept and start to further develop this idea of astrology uh, within a monotheistic context, but also astrology as a tool to really enlighten yourself in order to become more divine, to divine yourself, to move closer to God. And then we fast forward from there, uh, the discovery of Uranus about, you know, give or take 250 years ago, um, the discovery of Uranus marked a time when astrology moved out of Western universities, began to be villainized. It was the whole scientific revolution. And eventually astrology found its place um, first within the New Age community. Okay, so within the rising uh, theosophical movements, astrology found its place as um, a part of spiritualism, a rising spiritualism that was bridging between Eastern and Western mysticism and traditions, um, giving rise to these new cults, if you will, and these new ways of really hybrids of integrating different systems of belief. So astrology found its expression there. And that eventually led to um, astrology finding its expression through um, psychology and through psychoanalysis and through, in particular, archetypal psychology and became a tool of self-awareness, of further self-awareness, as part of reflecting the needs of a culture, but also as part of survival as well, because um, there were lots of twists and turns. I know this is sort of an abbreviated way of me talking about it, but there were lots of twists and turns, and and a, a lot of the, the great ancestors of astrology who were, whether they were villainized or put on trial or challenged uh, for practicing what they believed uh, was right, um, and that's not to say that there aren't people out there who do things that they shouldn't be doing, um, but that's true in every profession. For the most part, especially the people who we consider the great ancestors, the great godfathers, godmothers of our practice, um, overwhelmingly were people who used astrology as a spiritual practice, believed in themselves, believed in their instincts enough to share what it was that they, they perceived. So now I want to just contrast that a little bit with Vedic astrology. Now Vedic astrology as well is a living practice. And right now it's in a really interesting place because the culture in South Asia is changing dramatically. And that's mainly because of the rise of the middle class. And so the astrology is responding to that in that part of the world as well. But with Vedic astrology, it's not necessarily Hindu. Okay, so it's not necessarily rooted in a singular religion because there are Vedic astrologies that are rooted in or that um, respond to the needs of the different minority cultures in that area, primarily um, the Muslim communities in India, the Christian communities in India as well. And so when you think about the calculation methods, right, Western astrology is based on our perception of the sky. So we are the center of the universe and we are looking at the sky and based on the position of the planets from our perspective, we calculate where they are. But for Vedic astrology, you're actually looking at the position of the planets in relation to other fixed stars, in relation to other bodies 
out there in the world. And so if you think about it, really the Western paradigm, right, the Western way, the Western philosophy of looking at the world is the individual is the nucleus of the culture. And what we see and what we believe determines our reality. That is essentially what it means to have free will and to exert yourself and to take your life in whatever direction you choose. But in Vedic astrology, it's not as simple as that. With Vedic astrology, and you have to think that it's still true for many people in that part of the world, many people in South Asia as well. And again, as I said, it is evolving. Okay, It's responding to the rising middle class. And to be middle class means that you believe that you can work on your own behalf to improve your circumstances. It means to believe in your own free will to shape your destiny. And so the, the astrology is changing and evolving. But for, the, for a lot of people out there, and up until very recently, for most people um, within South Asia, really a, a lot of things were determined outside of you. The, the religion, the case system, a lot of things are determined by uh, the family in which you're born into. Um, you don't have a say over who you marry in some cases. You don't have a say over your profession in some cases. And so in such a, a culture... And with astrology reflecting that culture, it's going to be much more important as to what other bodies and other beings and other uh, factors are taking place outside of yourself and how they're relating to each other and how that speaks to you as opposed to how you are viewing them. So how we are viewing the sky is not as important in an Eastern paradigm as it is in a Western paradigm. Because in a Western paradigm, it is the individual that is the nucleus of the culture. In an Eastern paradigm, it is the family, it is the community that is the nucleus of the culture. And therefore, your family, your community determines much of your fate, decides much of your fate for you. And so given the context of this, as I said, there are a lot of hybrids within Vedic astrology. It isn't just that Vedic astrology is one thing. It isn't just that Western astrology is just one thing. And I know I've really oversimplified here, but with Vedic astrology, as I said, there are um, sort of these uh, hybrids where, okay, for example, when you go to a Vedic astrologer, a Vedic astrologer will also um, will read your chart and may also prescribe certain remedies, may prescribe prayers, um, may suggest you wear certain stones, that's called gemology, and, and make other recommendations in order to help you to improve your circumstances. Now, if you were to go to a Hindu astrologer, he would suggest to you different uh, gods that you might pray to. If you were to go to uh, a Vedic astrologer who was rooted in the Islamic tradition, um, or the Christian tradition, uh, they would suggest different passages in their, ref their respective books in the Quran or in the uh, Bible. Uh, they would suggest uh, different saints, different offerings to different saints, and so on. And so the practice and the belief system behind the philosophical assertion that that particular astrology is making is the same, but it's responding to uh, the needs of a particular community that it finds itself in. Because uh, religion is sort of um, like a, the clothing that a culture will wear, but ultimately the culture has its beliefs, and that those beliefs can be shared by the entirety of the culture, regardless of what their religious identity is or the surface religious practices are. And so why do I choose one of the other, mainly my family for one. Okay, so my family is very much a family um, that believes in um, our ability to direct our own lives. Um, that's one part of it. Um, and another part of it is me. That's my belief as well. I truly believe that um, to be human, one of the most sacred things about being human is that we have the power to shape our lives and to decide on our direction. Now, I do also think that most often, much, much of the time, not most of the time, there is a higher plan for us than what we can conceive, than what we believe we are meant to move towards and work towards. And by being receptive to the world, we can open ourselves up to that. But I do believe that we have a tremendous amount of say and a tremendous amount of power over our lives. And I say that not only because of the values with which I was raised, the values that my family is rooted in, but I say that also because of my own experience. And I recognize as I say that, 
that. Um, there are a lot of places in the world where people don't have that. To really exercise your options is um, a luxury in a lot of parts of the world. And I realize that I say that from a place of privilege, um, and I'm truly so grateful for it. So for me, when I look at a chart, when I look at the sky, I'm interested in how I am looking at the sky. I'm interested how you are looking at the sky and the world around you. And I'm interested in seeing how the chart is revealing all the blessings that are there, even in the things that look really tough and really hard, and how all of it is about fulfilling your potential. And all of it is about you becoming more aware of how you can make choices to move your life positively forward. Ultimately, I do think that one lifetime is not enough to know all that there is to know out there. There's so much to know in astrology. And really, I believe that if you're called to astrology, you you are called to it and chances are because I believe that we are now older souls than ever before um, I do think the fact if you're called to astrology chances are it's not your first lifetime uh, to be practicing astrology and chances are that your intuition will guide you to the systems the techniques uh, the perspectives and the experiences that you need in order to grow as an astrologer, in order to develop your spiritual practice, which therefore will help you grow spiritually and be more effective in the world and also help the clients uh, that you serve or the other people that you might read as well. Well, thank you so much for your questions. Please keep them coming. As I said, uh, you can reach out to me on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, and of course, my website, NadiaShaw.com. Truly so grateful for this moment with you. Until we connect again, take care. Thank you for watching. It'll be a great month. Be fabulous and enjoy.